Hello again. Recently, I felt inspired to play through Subnautica again. It was the Subnautica 2 trailer. That's, that's what inspired me to do it. I hadn't played it in probably two years, so I took my time, and after about a week, I finished it. Once I did, I decided that I had so much fun that I was going to start up a new world, and I played through the game again, and I beat it a few days ago. And you'll never guess what I did after that. My point here is that I love Subnautica. No other survival game I've ever played has really incorporated such deep storytelling and a horror atmosphere into its world quite like Unknown Worlds has, and I doubt anyone else will or could. This is unquestionably one of my top 10 games of all time and was probably one of the reasons I realized I wanted to be a marine biologist. This is not a review of the gameplay, however. Right? I'm not the act man. I can't articulate what I like about video games like he can, but what I can do is talk marine science. Fortunately, Subnautica has no shortage of that, and so that's what this video is going to focus on. Today, I'm going to give my best compliments and criticism of Subnautica's world from a scientific standpoint. Technically speaking, my degree isn't in marine biology, it was marine science, which gives me an elevated understanding of all marine and atmospheric systems. However, my focus in college was marine biology, which is by far my strongest suit. Now, it goes without saying that Subnautica is first and foremost a video game, so gameplay and fun come first over making the game as realistic as possible. Therefore, my criticism will be relatively surface level, pun not intended, because if I was going to nitpick everything scientifically improbable, we would be here until well after Subnautica 2 comes out. When discussing biology, and especially how things evolved, it is critical to understand the environment that these particular organisms live in. Now, the playable area of Subnautica is a dormant volcanic crater with a diameter of about two kilometers. For the most part, the shallowest regions tend to be towards the center with depth increasing the closer you get to the crater edge. That's what we should expect for what this is. We are essentially playing on a giant atoll, which is an area of seafloor that was formerly an island, but eventually eroded away. On top of this, the islands that eventually become barrier islands, atolls, and ultimately seamounts are originally created by hotspots, which are places in the Earth's crust where magma reaches the surface to form new rock despite a distinct lack of fault lines anywhere nearby. We see this most famously with Hawaii, and the path of the Pacific Plate carries the islands with it. Using this knowledge, we can predict when the hotspot was active or dormant, with islands and seamounts representing active points and a lack thereof being dormant periods. The atoll in Subnautica sits on its own and clearly still over the hotspot, meaning the hotspot created a single island before falling dormant, and the island still hasn't been moved by a tectonic plate in presumably millions of years. This might suggest that planet 4546b does not have shifting tectonic plates, which would not impact the feasibility of hotspots occurring, so we're all good there. In fact, in the very brief moment we see planet 4546b from space, the few land masses all seem to be small islands without any apparent chains, all more evidence towards the lack of tectonic activity. Now, I'm not sure if Unknown Worlds intended for this to work out so well, but if they did, I have to give some serious praise for that level of scientific accuracy. I actually pulled out my notes from college to try and find something wrong with what I've seen here, and I can't find anything that doesn't add up. 10 out of 10. As you might imagine, a region with a two kilometer diameter is not very big when talking about anything on Earth and it's unlikely you would find more than maybe two distinct environments in that area. 
So when Subnautica has 21, that's kind of pushing the realm of possibility in my eyes just a little bit. However, there are clear boundaries between each area that allow me to suspend my disbelief, even just a small amount. The safe shallows are the shallowest zone and support tons of coil. The kelp forest is a little deeper, presumably too deep for the coil, and instead supports creep vines. Deeper still is the grassy plateaus, too deep even for the creep vine, and instead has red seagrass. After that, the environments are more localized, usually only appearing in one specific area like Grand Reef, Bulb Zone, Mountains, Dunes. So while it isn't perfectly accurate to reality, gameplay does come first, and they certainly put an effort to make it believable. Subnautica has an absurd number of living things, both animals and plants. There is plenty of overlap, but the majority of them exist in a single environment, which is to be expected. Due to the sheer volume of life in this game, I'm not going to discuss everything right and wrong about them, just pick a random assortment of things. First, we're going to talk about the positives. I like the rock grub. It's nice to see a small animal in a game that's otherwise filled with giants. At first, I wasn't a fan of the crab squid's EMP because I didn't understand why something like that would evolve. But apparently they've been in an evolutionary arms race with the amp eel, and the EMP is a counter to its shock. So that's some pretty neat co-evolution right there. The reaper mandibles are actually really logical. A giant lumbering demon snakefish that can't exactly turn on a dime is pretty easy to avoid for small prey which could easily hide in cracks and crevices. The mandibles let the reaper grab fish that would otherwise slip past its face, or grab food trying to remain hidden in caves. The sea dragon, emperor, and cuttlefish have a very unique design, with a somewhat average vertebrate body for an upper half, but cephalopod tentacles as a bottom half. I don't exactly understand how this would have evolved, but I'm glad they stuck with this body plan for three different creatures. It makes the design more believable. The reef back adds a lot of great things to the game. First, it's likely the largest creature you've seen in your playthrough early on, and it's friendly, like a whale. The deep calls they make give more life to an already vibrant game. Their namesake, the plants and sessile animals that reside on their back, would explain how the other isolated, shallow regions of 4546B are presumably populated with largely the same species that would otherwise have to drift in the currents for thousands of miles. Loggerhead sea turtles do the same thing here on Earth, with tons of stuff growing on their shells and spreading across the sea. Now on to my criticisms. Remember, these do not impact how I feel about the game. I still think it's amazing. This part is just me calling out everything that doesn't perfectly line up with reality, but regardless, provide a more fun gaming experience. First off, there are way too many giant creatures in this game. There is exactly zero chance that life on this crater would not completely collapse in on itself due to the sheer volume of biomass sitting at the top of the food chain. Every leviathan is too big to exist, especially this one. Sea dragon leviathan's breathing fire is absolutely not going to happen ever. Nothing in the lava zone should be alive. Adult ghost leviathans are apparently planktivores, but also territorial. I'm sorry, but that does not work out. Planktivores cannot be territorial when they are this massive. They need to be constantly moving around the ocean to find more plankton to eat. Amp eels should not have electricity visible across their body. That's not really a thing. The crash fish makes zero sense. I don't think that one needs much explanation. It's kind of bizarre to me that some fish swim side to side and others move their body up and down. Many of the small cookable fish seem to have the former, while the large ones, with the exception of the sand shark, utilize the latter. It suggests that there are two major fish clades distinguished by the way they swim, 
but the criteria for which ones swim in any given way seem completely arbitrary other than their size. Eyes seem to be distributed at complete random. Two eyes or four seem to be the most common number, but the ghost leviathan again is baffling in this regard. There doesn't seem to be a great way of making a phylogenetic tree of the animals in this game. It feels like there are a lot of creatures that are completely unlike anything else around them. There are some exceptions like the peeper and boomerang having counterparts, but other than that, stuff just feels like a one-off. That's about everything I have to say. Overall, I give Subnautica and Unknown Worlds the highest praise for this game. It has given me countless hours of entertainment and ultimately helped me discover what I'm really passionate about in life. When Subnautica 2 drops, you already know I'm going to be playing that with my boys. And I do plan on making gameplay videos of it. So if you want to see that, please consider subscribing. Since it's going to be an early access, I figure that I can make some suggestions about how to make the creatures and world feel more fleshed out and maybe my ideas will even get heard by the devs. That's all I got for today. You all have yourselves a good one, and I hope you learned something.